Hey everybody, this is Dan from Mechanical Malarkey. Today I'm going to be taking apart this Honda K20 engine. This isn't going to be one of those videos where there's a whole lot of carnage in the engine because this engine was just mildly overheated. It still ran, but it had enough damage to it that we decided it was best just to replace it. As the name indicates, this is a 2 liter of the K-series. Specifically, this is a K20C2 variant, which is found in the LX and Sport Civics starting in 2016. The K20C1 is the turbocharged non-VTEC version for the Civic Type R, and the K20C4 is the turbocharged version for the Accord. So this is the current base model K20 engine. It's kind of funny because in the previous generations of Civics, the K20 was the SI engine. But now that's a 1.5 liter turbo. Before I dive into the teardown of this, a few more specifics about this engine in particular. The car came in, I believe, with a misfire. It was given to one of our master techs who spent a while looking at it. He found that some of the valves are a little bit tight, which he thinks means that there are some melted valve seats. And later he did a cooling system pressure test and he looked in the cylinders of the bore scope and you could see coolant dripping down the walls. Figured out based on some other evidence that this was overheated after an accident, either from the accident or because it was improperly repaired. So because this was overheated but was still running, Probably the only work it needs is checking that the block and head are not warped and fixing those valve seats. I'm not going to be rebuilding this myself because I personally don't have a use for it. And other people who might buy it, chances are they want it for some sort of higher performance application, which means they might want to change out pistons and rods or something like that. And I wouldn't want to go to all the trouble of building it and then someone just going to take it apart again. So I'm just going to take it apart, see everything I can see, Probably not take the pistons out and all that. And then I will sell it for a pretty good discount because of the need to go to a machine shop. Also, while I was unloading it from my truck, because I didn't have a hoist, I was rolling it down a ramp on a cart and right near the bottom it fell off and bent up a bunch of brackets as well as broke a few electrical connectors. Fortunately, it looks like the only ones that broke are this solenoid here and looks like an oil pressure switch. None of the more expensive VTEC solenoids or anything got damaged. We'll start off by removing the valve cover. When I got this engine, all the bolts were already out of this, so this will be pretty easy. Just pull it right off. So here we have the dual overhead cam set up. This is the intake side with the special cam for VTEC. And then this is the exhaust side. These, I believe, were the valves that the Master Tech said were tight. And if you look closely at the camshaft, you'll see that it's actually discolored, which is a sign of overheating. Like I said, I'm not going to be tearing down everything, but I do want to take off these bearing caps just to see what the bearings look like on this cam. Fortunately, the bearings look pretty good. It would be up to whoever's rebuilding it whether this cam should be replaced based on how hot it's gotten. This thing stinks. I don't know if it's just how these normally smell with the oil, but it is not pleasant. Just gonna pop all these back on lightly, not fully torqued. Now to take the head off, the first thing I have to do is take off the side cover and remove the timing chain. Looks like just an assortment of 10s, 12s, and 14s. First there's the VTEC solenoid here, spool valve. Now 
Looks like this solenoid assembly has to come off as well before the side cover. And you can work right around this water pump. Don't have to take that off. Pop these off. Little bit of oil as expected. Now yeah, it looks like I have to take this bracket off too because it's in the way of that. This bracket's pretty much garbage because it's all bent. Got to remove this engine mount stud to get to this bolt behind it. And loosen these 14s. Pretty tight, but that's where the engine mount is, so that makes sense. All right, now pop everything off. If you're ever doing this, don't forget there are bolts going up from the oil pan into the side cover. Before I get too far, I don't want to forget to take out the VTEC spool valve. That should be all the 10s, now for the 12s. All right, that is all the bolts all the way around. Now it's time to pry that off. Usually they try to provide some spots for sticking your pry bar, like right down here looks like a good spot maybe. Oh, there we go. And right here's another one. There we go, there's the side cover off. Now we'll remove this timing chain. Normal procedure is to turn the engine backwards to push this back in, but I'm just going to pop it off. Ooh, that's got a lot of force in it. Ooh. Yeah, there's a lot of force in that chain. That's why you normally push this in and stick a pin in. But again, I expect someone to be rebuilding this, so they're probably going to be replacing some of these components. Now you're going to want to remove this guide from when we take the head off. Forgot to bring my Allen sockets home, so... There we go. Basically an impact wrench. And remove the top guide. Now if you saw all the cams just shift when I released the top guide, that's because all of the valve springs are pushing up against the cam and it was being held in place, keeping them pushed down. So once there's no longer tension to keep the chain properly aligned on the gears, everything was able to shift based on how things were being pushed by the cams. That's why they usually have special pins you can stick in the cams to hold them in place when you're doing a timing setup. It's also why you need to make sure everything is in time when you're replacing a chain. You don't just pop it off and slap a new one on. Now there is enough slack that we can just take the chain right off. You have to remove this other guide too. And that's us film the oil pan. I've turned it on its side so it'll be easier to break the head bolts free. Now per regular proper procedure, I'll be going in a zigzag formation when I loosen these. All right, looks like I have to take this end piece off before I can get to that head bolt. It's like a bunch of 12s. 
And to get to this bolt, I have to take the cam sensor off first. There's always something in the way. I have to take this rear camshaft plate off as well. And since it's RTV'd on there, find where I can pry it. There we go. This just covers the back of the exhaust cam. Now I can get to the head bolt. Loosening really tight bolts like this is always fun because they make so many pops and squeaks. You always feel like you're breaking something, but you're not. All right, looks like before I take the head off, I have to take this whole water passage assembly off. If it looks like I don't know what I'm doing, that's because I have not taken apart an engine like this since college. Which is the whole reason I decided to take this engine home. Now to make a really big mess. Okay, now I should be able to remove the head. Once I take out all of the head bolts. Yeah, if there's any more coolant in this engine, it's gonna be coming out pretty soon. Now we can get a look at the cylinders. These two middle cylinders are where we saw the coolant leaking in. It doesn't look like the head gasket is blown. So it probably is just warped the head in the block a little bit when it overheated. Let's look at the other side of it. See no obvious damage. And the kind of warping that would cause coolant leak is nothing that I would be able to see with my own eye. You usually have to use a straight edge and feeler gauges to figure that out. Take a look under the cylinder head. Again, there's no obvious damage. But you can see there's a lot of stuff on these valves where it was leaking coolant in. They're pushed out a little bit right now because there's still pressure from the cam, but there might be some melted seats in there with how tight the valves were before they were adjusted by the tech. And the last thing I want to do is take off the oil pan just to take a look in there which means flipping this over, which means dumping all of the remaining coolant out on the floor. Hey, there's that bolt. Okay, I just had to change how this was mounted on my stand because I was using these holes that are part of the oil pan itself to mount it. So I had to move this one down and then I don't have anywhere to put this last one. So it's only on three right now, but it is just the block. So it's a lot lighter. Now just a whole bunch of 10 mils. Now find some prying locations, like over here. 
There we go. There we go. Ugh, that is some sludgy looking oil in there. Probably does have some uh, coolant contamination. Yeah, that is not the consistency that oil is supposed to be. That is probably from the oil leaking into the cylinders and then past the piston rings. So here is the oil pump and pickup tube. And it looks like an oil return over here. I'm not going to bother taking any of this stuff off because I've seen about all I need to see. Well, that was a lot of fun tearing apart this engine. Wasn't anything majorly damaged to look at, but that pretty sludgy oil was a nice find. If you like this video, I have a few more engines that I'm planning on taking apart, and they actually will have some damage, I'm pretty sure, because they did not run and were towed into the shop. So if you like this video, let me know. Please like, comment, subscribe to the channel. Follow me on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And read the blog at mechanicalmalarkey.com. Thanks for watching.